Jane is a professor, professor of social work and public affairs at Columbia University School of Social Work and a visiting professor at the Center for Analysis of Social Exclusion at the London School of Economics. During 2008-2009 academic years, she is a Marion Cabot Putnam Memorial Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, where she's writing a book about Britain's war on poverty. Uh, she received her PhD in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Richard Nisbet is a Theodore M. Newcomb Distinguished University Professor at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He's written extensively on intelligence and cultural psychology and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He is currently co-director of, cult of the Culture and Cognition Program at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and is a research professor at the Institute for Social Research. Uh, both of their bios list their books, but I'm going to save time, and you can look their books up later, because uh, we're here to talk about two of their books today. So without any further ado, let me introduce Jane. Uh, thank you, Ron, and it's really a pleasure to be here um, tonight uh, to talk about uh, steady gain, stall progress, and question mark in terms of the next period. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a book that I uh, co-edited with Catherine Magnuson called Steady Gains and Stalled Progress. And I want to start by acknowledging the contributors to the book. So these, this slide shows you the chapter authors, uh, including Ron Ferguson, who wrote the concluding chapter for us. So today's presentation, I want to focus on three questions. First, what are the trends in the black-white test score gap? Second, what explains them? And then third, looking forward, are we entering another period of gap closing? So let me start with the trends in the reading scores. Uh, what I'm showing you on this graph is uh, the reading score trends from the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, long-term trend data. So this is the data that we can use to track trends over time. Uh, for 9-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and 17-year-olds. And for each age group, the dotted line is the scores for African-American children. The solid line are the scores for white children. And um, the first thing you'll notice is that uh, as you look uh, over this 30-year span, I don't know if you can read the numbers, it starts in 1971 and goes through 2004, overall reading scores are fairly flat over this period on these constant tests. But um, that flatness, you know, uh, covers up really tremendous changes in the black-white test score gap over the period. And we can really see three distinct periods in these data, which I, I'll illustrate for you looking at the nine-year-old data. So um, starting here in 1971, these numbers show you the black-white test score gap for each age group at each year. So back in 1971, uh, okay, I can see the arrow, but you can't see it. So the point... You can see it, but where has it gone now? Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. You can see it. Okay, so the We're actually videotaping, so if you let's see it on the screen and talk to the mic. Okay, <laughs> that'll be better. Okay, uh, but now I've lost it again. Oh, gosh. Uh, so um, back in 1971, uh, for nine-year-olds, the black-white test score gap in reading was 44 points, and what you can see over... Uh, over this period from 71 till the late 1980s to 1988 is this tremendous convergence, this period of steady gains. So the black-white test score gap falls from 44 points back in 71 to 29 points by 1988. You can see similar progress for the 13-year-olds with the gap is falling from 39 points down to 18, and for 17-year-olds where the gap's falling from 52 points down to 20. So this is that period of steady gains, period of dramatic convergence. The next period, the period from 1988 to 1999, is this period of stalled progress. Whichever age group we look at, the convergence in the black-white test scores stalls. And in some cases, this gap actually widens. So illustrating with the nine-year-olds, we see this uh, gap, which was 29 points back in 88, is now 35 points in 99. And similarly for the 13-year-olds and the 17-year-olds. So this is the period of stalled progress. Now, interestingly, the last data point that we have here is from 2004. Uh, the NAEP was also administered in 2008, but uh, the results haven't been released yet. So the most recent data we have in, in terms of long-term trend is from 2004. Well, what you can see if you compare 99 and 2004 is that we're starting to see convergence again. 
uh, especially for the nine-year-olds. So the black-white test score gap for nine-year-olds is falling from 35 points in 99 down to 26 points uh, in 2004, and likewise a little bit of convergence for the 13-year-olds and the 17-year-olds. Okay, the trends for math scores, one difference you'll notice right away is that there's this secular upward trend in math scores. Unlike in reading, where overall scores have been pretty flat, in math the scores are actually going up for all groups. But we see the same pattern, the pattern of steady gains in the initial period. So look at the nine-year-olds, the black-white gaps falling from 35 down to 25. Um, likewise, the 13-year-olds, 46 points down to 24. The 17-year-olds, 40 points down to 21 points. So this period of steady gains, dramatic convergence, then we go into this period of stalled progress, right, where the gaps are stagnant or even widen out again. And then we see at the very end of the period, in this last five years, again, uh, this uptick um, suggesting that possibly we're entering another period of steady gains or renewed progress uh, with five points of gap closing for the nine-year-olds. This number is 32, so there's five points of closing here and three points here. So just to summarize, I know I went through those graphs kind of fast. Uh, what you see there is that although there are differing underlying trends for reading and math, across both of them we're seeing after dramatic gains in the 70s and 80s, the progress in closing the gap stalled in the late 80s and the 1990s. Okay, so uh, turning to the second question, what explains these trends, uh, we're going to want to look at the three periods separately because, we, as you could see, there were three really distinct periods in the data. So the first period is this period of steady gains, and this was the focus of the earlier book by Christopher Jenks and Meredith Phillips. And they looked at, they and their authors looked at a host of factors, and they found that both family and school factors played a role in the convergence. So at the family level, the improvements in parental education were very important. At the school level, there were declines in school segregation with associated improvements in teacher and school quality. Okay, so what about this next period, this period of stalled progress? Well, this is really where we focus in this book because this is the period that Jenks and Phillips couldn't look at in their book because they didn't yet have the data. So, Again, we find that both family and school factors played a role. At the family level, parental education, which was so important in the convergence in the earlier period, stopped converging. And likewise, school segregation, which had been so important in the earlier period, school desegregation, stopped improving or actually worsened, depending on the measure. And likewise, gaps in teacher quality, which had been improving in the earlier period, started widening, especially at the primary level. So I can show you some data on this. Um, this is from Chapter 2, uh, the Barons and Penaloza chapter. They're looking at four successive co cohorts of high school seniors across this 30-year span. And you can see that um, in the initial part of the period, there's a, a, a black-white difference in maternal education uh, that's quite sizable. It's almost a year. And this is narrowing in the early part of the period but then it's absolutely flat in the later part of the period. So this is what I mean by improvements in parental education stopped or slowed down. Um, similarly, this, this is one measure of segregation or dissimilarity. This is the proportion minority in the average child school. And um, in the initial part of the period, uh, it's, there's actually an improvement for black kids relative to white kids, and then you can see the black-white difference widening quite substantially as schools start resegregating over this period, again using the same data from Barron's and Penaloza. Um, this table, I have to apologize, I took it from a, a great chapter by Sean Corcoran and Bill Evans, and I couldn't edit the numbers, so they're in this tiny type, which uh, probably is very hard to read. So, and it's a lot of numbers. So let me just highlight one set of numbers, uh, the numbers around years of teacher experience. Uh, so this is data on elementary school teachers for um, 1991 and 2000, and they're interested in whether things worsened or got better for black kids relative to white kids. And so back in 91, 
there's a, a teacher experience shortfall. On average, uh, the average black kid has a less experienced teacher by about a third of a year of experience. Well, by 2000, that's now one and a third, 1.4 years of experience, that gap. So this is what I mean by teacher quality for black kids relative to white kids worsened over the period, uh, whereas it had been improving in the earlier period. And this is particularly true at the elementary level, not, at the sec not so much at the secondary level. Okay, um, and then there's the third phase. We saw there's the stall progress, there's the steady gains, there's the stall progress, and maybe now we're into this period of renewed progress of gap closing in the late 90s and early 2000s. So, you know, here we can only speculate what's, what's driving these changes in the most recent period, uh, but it's likely that both family and school factors are playing a role like they did in the earlier periods. So at the family level, um, I would actually highlight the sharp decline in black child poverty in the 1990s as being an important factor. Uh, keeping in mind that the group who's made uh, the greatest gains from 99 to 2004 are the nine-year-olds tested in 2004. These are kids who were in early childhood in the mid-90s to the late 90s when there was this dramatic fall in black child poverty. Uh, and let me just show you that, because I think it's not, not so well known. This bottom line, this orange line, is the trend in child poverty for white children. You see it going up gently in the recessions. It goes down in the, when the economy improves, goes up again in the recessions. This green line, much higher and with much more movement around the economic cycle, is the trend line for black children. And this is... This is the dramatic decline in black child poverty that I'm talking about in the mid-90s to late-90s, early 2000s. So th this would have affected this cohort of kids affected in 2004, which is why I, I you know, highlight it as being a potentially important factor. Um, the other factor is at the school level, uh, you, know, you all know there's been increased focus on accountability and test score gaps at both the state level and the federal level. And I think here we, you know, I hate to do this, but we actually have to give some credit to No Child Left Behind. As flawed as it was, it did shine a bright light on achievement gaps, and I, I think it did play a role in uh, promoting the progress that we saw in the most recent period. Okay, so th the final question is, um, I think I'm doing all right for time. Um, are we entering another period of gap closing? Um, well, the trend from 99 to 2004 is certainly encouraging, especially for the nine-year-olds. But, you know, we'll be on a lot firmer ground when the NAEP long-term trend data for 2008 are released, because you really don't want to place too much weight on just one data point. Um, then there's the question of what's going to happen post-2008. So the NAEP data is going to come out for 2008. That's not going to tell us what's going to happen from that point forward. Well, you know, optimistically, uh, there's going to be a continued focus on accountability at the state and federal level. That's going to help close achievement gaps. Plus, you know, look at all these new federal efforts. I mean, you look at the announcements that have come out of the Obama administration in the last, what, six weeks. Uh, biggest increase in spending in education, uh, big increase in spending for Head Start. Uh, he gave a speech today about education reform. Uh, and, you know, what specifically Obama's talking about is expanding preschool, improving schools, enhancing the role of parents, and providing more aid for low-income kids to go to college. These are exactly the four steps that we recommended um, when we concluded the work on our volume. Uh, so these are exactly the right policies to be closing achievement gaps. Uh, what I don't think any of us foresaw, you know, over the last several years as we worked on this project was what would happen to the economy. And, um, you know, I've highlighted the important role of poverty in, especially in kids' early childhood experiences. So, you know, the, the recession is, is very concerning for a lot of reasons, but in particular for what it'll do to child poverty and state education budgets. And, you know, we really have to worry that as fast as uh, President Obama is increasing federal funding for education, the states are going to be withdrawing funding and turning that funding over to, um, to other needs. Uh, so that is concerning. So just to wrap up, um, I've tried to emphasize that both family and school factors help account for the periods of steady gains, stalled progress, and possibly what we're seeing again as a period of renewed gains. Uh, 
Whether or and how much we're going to close gaps in the coming years is uncertain, although I'm very optimistic given the, given the you know, direction of federal policy at this point. But I want to underscore one thing, which I think is very clear as you look at the data across the last 30 years. Uh, I'm not going to name any names, but those who asserted that the black-white test score gap could not be closed were clearly wrong because there's, you clearly see tremendous convergence at some periods over the last 30 years. And then you see other periods where policies shift, factors shift, and there's not so much convergence. This suggests that the black-white test score gap is extremely sensitive to environmental factors, to social factors, to policy factors. Uh, so I just want to underscore that finding that comes out of the data. Um, so in conclusion, the trends over the past 30 years provide ample proof that we can close the black-white test score gap, and that's why I was happy that we called this forum Yes, We Can. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Ron, for inviting me, and thanks for your lovely book, which I got to read on the occasion. I only wish I'd known about your book when I wrote my book. It would have been a better book. Um, I'd like to uh, talk a bit about um, the uh, frame that uh, these questions uh, exist within. Um, that is, the um, assumptions that the educated lay public have about some of these issues, and that includes most people in the psychology profession that I ever talked to. Uh, and that frame comes from a book in 1994 called The Bell Curve by Richard Hernstein and Charles Murray. And people who read that book and people who read about that book and who talked to people who read about that book came away with the following beliefs. Uh, that uh, intelligence is mostly a matter of heredity. Uh, that uh, the, core, the uh, heritability is 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 uh, for IQ, uh, that families make little difference uh, to intelligence, the difference between any two randomly selected families which differ from each other by a standard deviation on average uh, on any given attribute you might mention, which would include socioeconomic status, for example. Uh, this accounts for little. Certainly by the time people are adults, there's no trace of the shared environment difference between the Smith family and the Jones family on average. Schools are not very important uh, to uh, developing intelligence. Uh, intelligence just basically unfolds in any uh, normal environment, and schools are not uh, central to that. Uh, the uh, social classes are drawing ever further apart uh, in intelligence. Uh, because uh, there is increasing enclavization. People in educated audiences like this associate with one another, and they have children together, and people uh, in other enclaves uh, have lower IQ, and so the social classes are separating uh, in their IQ. Blacks have IQs that have had IQs for the last 80 years that are 15 points below those of whites, uh, and most of that is due to genetics. Uh, and there's a policy implication of all of this, which is that intervention uh, is not going to be successful with the poor uh, and with minorities, and we should probably just save our money. Um, now, let me take those one by one uh, and show you what I now believe about those, what I think the data compel us to, the conclusion that all of these beliefs are quite wrong. First of all, heritability estimates uh, depend on some errors that have been made. Uh, they're perfectly understandable errors, but errors nonetheless. Uh, the uh, assumption that uh, the heritability of IQ is 0.75 comes, for example, in part from the fact that identical twins raised separately uh, correlate uh, to the tune of 0.75 in their IQ. The assumption is, well, look, uh, the environments are different, and these people are ex extremely similar nevertheless. Uh, but it turns out the environments often don't differ uh, all that much. Uh, that there is a, a, a substantial similarity in the environments in which identical twins who've been separated uh, are uh, raised in, often in the same town, frequently by relatives, often go to the same school. When you look at maximally different uh, environments that identical twins are raised in, the correlations drop to about 0.3. Uh, uh, 
the assumption that uh, families make little difference comes in part from the fact that the correlation for adopted kids with their natural parents' uh, IQ is moderate, and the correlation of those adopted kids with their adoptive parents is near zero. The conclusion is reached then, the environment's not important, a class will tell, so to speak, the genes are showing through, the a family environment matters little. But it turns out that uh, adoptive families uh, are quite different uh, from families in general. Adoptive families are like Tolstoy's happy families, uh, they're all the same. Uh, they are uh, upper middle class and middle class uh, for the most part. Uh, and even those who are lower SES are models of uh, socialization for intelligence. Uh, and that restriction of range means that you can't have much of a contribution uh, of, the, of the environment. Uh, in fact, if you account for the restriction of range, it's possible that as much as 50 percent of, uh, of the difference in uh, IQ is due to shared environment differences in the family. Uh, Geneticists will tell you that there's no such thing as the heritability of any given attribute. Uh, it's very much population dependent, uh, and that's especially true for IQ. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, heritability for upper middle class people of IQ, it's about 0.7 or 0.8. Uh, and uh, if you look at what it is for lower SES people, it's about uh, 0.1. Why should there be such a massive difference in heritability? Well, it's because uh, upper middle class uh, families are pre uh, presenting environments to their kids which are maximally uh, supportive of IQ, and there's probably not that much difference between Dr. Smith's family and Lawyer Jones's family in terms of what they're doing, and so the only thing that can account for a great deal of the variance uh, is genes. But for lower SES families, the environment probably ranges from as good as you would ever have in an upper middle class family to chaotic and disruptive in every sense. If the environment is hugely variable like that, genes are not going to account for much at all. Uh, a final point about heritability that's uh, crucial to understand is that uh, heritability poses no limits to the, to the amount of which it, the environment can influence any given attribute. And it's enough to say, just as a thought experiment there, somebody could come up with a pill tomorrow which would increase uh, IQ uh, by a standard deviation, 15 points. As a matter of fact, there has been such a pill. It's been given to all of us. Uh, and we don't know exactly what it was, but IQ has increased in this country by 18 points in the last 60 years. That's enough to establish that IQ is hugely malleable. We don't know how much Intelligence has been influenced in the last uh, 60 years. Intelligence as God sees it. But certainly some of the IQ differences are real in intelligence. For example, in comprehension of the way the world operates, uh, and vocabulary increases uh, have been very large. So intelligence is increasing uh, very substantially. How much is the range in which we could affect a lower SES uh, child's IQ? Well, we know that from adoptive uh, family natural exper experiments. A lower class child who's adopted into an upper middle class family will have an IQ about 15 points higher than one who's raised in a lower class family. So we know there are massive environmental differences that are making the difference between somebody who's likely to graduate from high school, maybe have a year or two of junior college, versus someone at the lower extreme IQ of like 85 who would uh, be expected to be a high school dropout, who would have a, a career ceiling of uh, skilled labor, uh, would be a candidate for being a public charge. An absolutely massive difference that the family is causing. How about schools? Well, they turn out you can't be smart without school, uh, which uh, uh, somehow escaped uh, Ernstein and Murray's uh, notice. Uh, if uh, somebody... If, if a child is prevented lots of natural experiments, prevent children from being in school, uh, and uh, it's worth about four or five IQ points per year of school missed. There are many ways that, obviously, that uh, schooling can be improved. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we know that, um, that uh, for example, just take one example, that there are computer programs for science, math, and uh, reading. Uh, which can affect uh, by as much as a standard deviation uh, the, the performance of kids uh, who are in those uh, fields. 
Uh, so there can be a huge difference uh, that's made by, uh, uh, by various kinds of educational interventions. The socioeconomic uh, status gap uh, is not increasing. It's actually, if anything, getting smaller. It stands today at about 95 IQ uh, for the lower third of SES distribution, 105 for the higher third of SES distribution. Uh, and uh, how, how much of that is due to genetics? Some of it, almost surely. Smarter people tend to gravitate up in the socioeconomic chain, and they bring their genes with them. But uh, uh, my guess is that most of that difference uh, is environmental. Um, then uh, how about the, the uh, IQ difference between blacks and whites? It isn't just that the NAEP uh, has been improving over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, the gap in IQ between blacks and whites has dropped from 15 points to 9.5 points. Um, and um, how do we know that uh, there's no contribution of genetics to the black-white difference? Um, for one thing, we know that European uh, um, genes in the black population constitute about 20% of the total. This means if any, any given black in the population in the U.S. is somewhere from 100% African genetically to mostly uh, European genetically. However you want to look at the, at the, at the, at the relative uh, uh, African versus European constitution of any individual black, that makes no difference to IQ, whether you do it by looking at skin color, at uh, blood tests that indicate uh, or origin of country, there's no, uh, it's, it's clear that there's no genetic contribution. We also know some of the environmental, what some of the environmental contributions are to that by a couple of natural experiments that have occurred. One is uh, the adoption of black kids in the middle class families that are either white or black with all of the neighborhood and peer and family socialization differences that that might entail. The study was done about 30 years ago. That makes a difference of 13 IQ points to be raised by a white versus a black middle class family. A part of that probably has to do with, with socialization uh, in the family. Uh, there's a natural experiment that comes from the fact that uh, black and white uh, often get married and uh, there are children that result from that, but sometimes it's the mother who's white, sometimes it's the mother who's black. If it's the mother who's white, that's worth nine IQ points as compared with when the mother is black. There's no possible genetic explanation for that. Some of it is undoubtedly no neighborhood, school, peer effects. Some of it probably is socialization, which uh, for, for blacks uh, in, in general is similar to, even for relatively middle class blacks, is similar to relatively lower SES families. That's probably due to the fact that middle class blacks often are, uh, have only been in the middle class for a generation uh, and they are more likely to have socialization practices which are characteristic of, uh, of lower SES people. Um, okay, uh, now what can be done about all of this? I'm not a fan of Head Start. Uh, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's terribly effective uh, over the long run. However, we know that there are early childhood programs which are enormously effective, which, uh, which decrease the likelihood of being put back in class, decrease the likelihood of uh, being put into special education, which enormously increase the likelihood of graduation from high school, enormously increase the likelihood of college, uh, increase the likelihood of owning their own home, make the huge differences that can be made by early childhood education in demonstration projects. Um, what if they were, these were to be continued? Uh, there are some whole school interventions that uh, seem to make a huge difference. The KIPP program, Knowledge is Power program with poor minority kids, looks at kids coming into the fifth grade uh, who are about 25% of them are at or above national average. Uh, in reading. Uh, at the end of that fifth uh, grade, uh, they're 44% uh, or at or above national average for reading. 37% start out above, in, uh, above that in the uh, national average in math, and 65% uh, end up above it. Um, so uh, we know that early childhood education can make a huge difference. We know that education at the junior high level can make a huge difference at the middle school level. Uh, we know that, difference, that differences can be made also at the high school level. We know this from the stand and deliver uh, Jaime Escalante uh, experiment where East Los Angeles Barrio kids were performing in calculus at a much higher level than even the private 
uh, uh, private schools in Beverly Hills. Um, well, uh, what my at a policy level, coming way back up to a policy level difference, uh, what would matter? If we want the, if we want the poor uh, to be smarter, we should probably make them richer. We tend to have very uh, high uh, uh, socioeconomic status differences in this country, and the SES gap is highly related to the, uh, to the, uh, to the academic achievement gap. Um, there are several things that uh, seem to me to be uh, advisable. Uh, earned income tax credits uh, ought to be increased. Child dependence allowance ought to be increased. The minimum wage today is 70% of what it was in 1960 in real dollar terms. Um, now, uh, what could be done in terms of, of, uh, of pre-K education? What could be done in terms of, of uh, elementary education? It would be possible to give the bottom socioeconomic one-third in this country uh, one of these uh, optimal uh, pre-K experiences, if it were possible to scale it up uh, that way. It could be done uh, for the bottom third for a cost of about $85 billion. That's last week's bailout money for AIG. Uh, it's also about equivalent to what the... Uh, the cost to the Treasury of the post-2000 tax cuts for the richest 1% in this country, $93 billion, for just for the top, the tax cuts just for the top 1%. To give a tip, KIPP-type education uh, to uh, uh, the bottom one-third of kids from K through the ninth grade uh, would cost about $35 billion. That's two weeks ago. Uh, contribution to AIG. Uh, but to be clear, I'm not urging that, uh, that these things be uh, tackled immediately. I am, er what I think is essential is to do more research to see how much uh, these things can scale up. Thanks very much. We actually post all achievement, all AGI events on the internet. So there are about a hundred presentations that you can go back and watch on the video library. I'm just hoping nobody cuts out the first two or three minutes of your presentation before you said all those things were wrong. <laughs> you, you listen them off very succinctly. <laughs> if somebody wanted to take it out of context, they could have a field day. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to, I guess. First up on the screen, this is a comment on my book uh, that appeared in Education Next uh, last summer. It's mostly complimentary. Ferguson ranges well behind, beyond schools to economic factors, teacher attitudes, parenting practices, cultural constructs, community views, some interventions such as his own tripod project designed to narrow the achievement gap. The volume provides an illuminating and alarming tour of today's racial gaps and many factors that feed them, along with revealing data, prescriptive analysis, and welcome candor, however, comes a certain skittishness in sensitive areas such as African-American parenting practices, a bit of folly, encouragement of dialect and street language in English classes, and some sky pie about collective action and national leadership to solve problems for which there are no easy answers. Um, well, I'm going to end today by going back to the sky pie. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's time to think of this work in terms of a national, social, and cultural movement where we mobilize folks in all walks of life to find all kinds of opportunities to contribute to addressing these issues. The presentations you've heard already, some of what I'll say, I think pretty firmly establish the plausibility of the proposition that we can come pretty close over the next 20 years or so to closing these gaps, and it really matters that we do. I just want to show you a couple of the charts to remind us why everybody's talking about achievement gaps these days. This is the population shares in 2000. You'll see whites were 68% of the U.S. population in 2000. The projection is that by 2050, whites will be 46% of the population. We will be a majority non-white nation, with blacks and Hispanics being over 40% of the population. And we're going to be a majority non-white nation among children even before this. So if we don't make the progress that we need to make in narrowing these achievement gaps, that's a recipe perhaps for social instability and economic decline. If we want to see what the problem is in looking at it another way, um, 
These two charts here are pretty much the same. I'll focus on this second one. This is math problem solving for developed nations, the OECD nations. And we see there even our white kids are more than a, do a dozen back in the pack. Okay, our white students are no longer leading the world academically by the time they hit their middle teens. Okay, we see, you, can, you, can, you can't see the words at the bottom, but those are the nations where whites are outperforming our kids in math are Korea, Finland, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Belgium, Switzerland, Netherlands, France, Denmark, Czech Republic, Germany, Sweden, and then white kids in the United States. Okay, sometimes I present these numbers and people start making all kinds of excuses. Well, they're, and they tell all stories. I don't care what the story is. We shouldn't be that far back in the pack. And so when we talk about achievement gap issues, we need to move our white kids further up to the front of the pack, even as we accelerate progress for our non-white kids. So that, as I've just pointed out, that first blue line, the, the one that's furthest to your right, is white kids in the U.S. The next one is Asian kids in the United States. Then is the United States average right here. Then Hispanic kids, and those whose language skills were good enough to take the test, where there's Hispanic kids, black kids, and then Turkey and Mexico. So our population shares are shifting in the direction of Turkey and Mexico with regard to our achievement levels. I think all of us are arguing we don't have to go there. And so the challenge is to organize ourselves not to go there. This is a picture of the table of contents of my book. Uh, my book is a collected volume of the papers that I've written on the achievement gap, or at least a number of the papers I've written on the achievement gap, beginning in the, in the mid-1990s. Uh, the first one listed, lifted, listed there is Shifting Challenges, 50 Years of Economic Change Toward Black-White Earnings Equality. The work in this paper is the one that got me interested in test scores. Uh, there, was huge in, there was huge improvement in black earnings relative to white earnings um, from the 1940s through the 1990s. Skills were a piece of that story. If we look to see what contributed to the improvements, black migration away from southern states, improvements in the quantity and quality of schooling, reduced discriminatory barriers, all were part of the story. But by the time we got to the 1990s, early, late 80s, early 90s, the economy had also changed in a, in a way that made basic reading and math skills even more important than they had been historically. This chart is a chart from chapter one of the volume. The long, uh, light blue lines, and the percentages there are the percentage hourly wage gaps between young black and white men if you don't adjust for test scores. If you adjust for test scores and look at the hourly wage gaps among young black and white men who had the same test scores, those are the percentages on the dark blue lines. And you'll see for, and these, you'll see this was the Northeast, the Midwest, the South, and then this is uh, guys with 12 or fewer years of schooling, and those are 13 or more years of schooling. So more than half of the hourly earnings gap was predicted by differences in test scores. That's what got me interested in test scores. As an, I'm an economist by training. And I, we were looking at wages and the issues. If we want to figure out ways to do something about earnings, hourly earnings, maybe improve the test scores is what the findings were showing us. And so that's why I have shifted in this direction with regard to what I pay attention to. The second chapter of the book, Test Score Trends Along Racial Lines, 1971 and 96, Popular Culture and Community Academic Standards, I was interested in some of the things that Jane talked about, why did progress stop at the end of the 1990s, at the end of the 1980s? And one of the charts that helps to give a picture of what happened with regard to progress, here, I'm going to start with the chart for whites here, just to make the point that if you look at that red line, that's test scores for white 17-year-olds in reading, the one I'm indicating at the top of the screen. It's pretty much a flat line. For white kids, they've been in the same place for almost 40 years as 17-year-olds in reading. Uh, now, if this is Hispanics, this is blacks, and just let me focus on the chart for blacks here. The zero line on this chart is where whites were in 1996, which is pretty much where they were the whole period. So we see here from the 1971, which is where the arrow is here up to the line, is much larger than 1988 up to the line. That's, six, that's a 62% reduction in the black-white reading score gap in 17 years in the, in the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Now, the way this chart is set up is you can read vertically within birth cohort. 
And what we see is the 13-year-olds who were 13-year-olds in 1988 had the highest test scores that black 13-year-olds have ever had. That same birth cohort, not exactly the same kids, but randomly sampled from the same birth cohort, by the time that they were 17-year-olds, were behind the previous two birth cohorts. They had not made much progress in their reading skills during their teenage years. So these kids who had been the best ever as 13-year-olds shut down in some ways during their teenage years. We don't know for sure why that was true. The long-term secular changes in, in family background um, indices that Jane talked about are surely important behind this. But it looks like there was something fairly short-term that happened at the end of the 1980s. We see the gap between the green line and the red line opens up a little bit after 1988, partly because the green line turned down. But um, there was a national shift in black and Latino youth culture at the end of the 1980s. And um, I won't try to talk a lot about it here. I have no idea how important it was overall, but as we look for stories, um, that's one place to look, and there are stories that one can tell that are plausible that have to do with behavior and time use patterns. Let me uh, move on. Also, to in, here, this is SAT scores. And you see also right around 1988, 89 is when the SAT scores stopped rising for black kids. Actually, for Mexican-American kids, they peaked and turned down after that. And the blue, the blue line are white kids, and that's kind of meandering and not really going anywhere, just like the other chart on the Nate. These are all anchored in 1976. So let me keep going. So the first point, the first chapter, again, we're talking about changes in earnings and finding out that we can associate at least some of that story with changes in the quality of schooling and that test scores are important predictors of, of earnings gaps. Then we go on and look at recent trends in test scores and find that at the point where progress stopped rising, the stalled progress, the beginning of that for the teenagers, is also a point when there's a particular birth cohort that shut down at the end of during, during its teenage years in terms of reading. In math, the setbacks weren't quite as dramatic. The progress also stopped, but it wasn't a, as, as dramatic. The, um, so, actually, well, let me say this. I forgot I put this slide in here. Now that I put it in there, I'll just tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> um, 1988 was a commercial takeoff year for hip-hop. And so the period from 1988 to 92 was the 13 to 17-year-old age period for uh, young folks during the period when it was just brand new, brand new it was starting. Uh, in the surveys that we do of students and teachers, students and teachers now, we ask the students about the importance of various music forms to themselves. This chart shows the relationship between hip-hop and self-esteem for black kids. And what we see here is that, and I know I'm going through this quickly, but for black kids who say hip-hop is never important in their lives, their self-esteem is represented by the long negative black arrow down here. If it's never important, they have very low self-esteem. As the importance to them goes up from never to not usually to sometimes to usually to always, it goes from very low to very high. Okay. There are lots of sociological reasons why young people's sense of self would be very tightly connected to the depth of their engagement with the pop culture uh, we can talk about some of that during the discussions. But what we're suggesting is a pop cultural phenomenon opened up at the end of the 1980s that gave a strong sense of identity and meaning to a, group, a, young, to a whole population of youth. And this may have something to do with the story for what was going on with them academically through that period. Uh, this just looks at self-esteem by grades. And here, um, this is A, B, C, D, and E grade point averages among black males. And the black bars are those to whom hip-hop pretty Im plays an important role in their lives. The light bars are those to whom hip-hop does not play an important role in their lives, or is, uh, at, what do we say, seldom, play, seldom plays an important role. That's the light blue bars. And we see for the girls and the boys, if they're not in the in crowd where hip-hop is kind of important to them, their self-esteem goes plummets as their GPA falls off. But if, if hip-hop is important, their self-esteem doesn't fall that much because their self-esteem is coming from someplace else. It's coming from their, their connections to their, to their peer group. Um, there's a middle of the book from chapters 3 through 7 
are focused on various topics having to do with schooling, and I probably shouldn't try to summarize any of that right now, but there's a chapter that looks at a bunch of topics, uh, the best research we can find on preschool, grouping and tracking, instructional interventions, matching students and teachers by race, class size, teacher quality, and all those asks whether these things have any, any role to play as we work on it, trying to choke, close the achievement gap. Uh, chapter four, teacher's perceptions, expectations, and the black-white test score gap. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the teacher expectations literature here. Uh, found three different notions of what bias is in that literature. And whether you think teachers are biased or not depends upon which notion of bias you have in mind. And um, I invite you to read the chapter to get the details on that. The uh, Diagnostic Analysis of Black-White GPA Disparities in Shaker Heights, Ohio. That's the same community that Ogbu's last book uh, was about. I come to slightly different conclusions than he does. There are actually bigger socioeconomic differences in Shaker Heights than Ogbu acknowledged. Um, and I'll leave it at that for the moment. Uh, what doesn't meet the eye, understanding and addressing racial dis achievement disparities in high-achieving suburban schools, uses the same survey that we use to study Shaker Heights, but now uses 15 suburban school districts as, as the focus and find study, uh, findings that are pretty similar to what we found in Shaker Heights. One of the things we found in both studies that affected people's understanding of what was going on is it was clear in both of these studies, black students reported lower homework completion rates and worse behavior than whites did. They self-reported lower homework completion and worse behavior. But then, if you think about what does a teacher infer, seeing certain, certain kids aren't handing in their homework and they're behaving worse, well, you assume they aren't working as hard, they don't care as much about doing well in school. Well, the questions that were we asked more directly about working hard and, and wanting to do well, there were no racial differences. So even though there were differences in homework completion rates, there were no racial differences to speak of in time on homework. Okay, and these were middle and high school students. What appeared to be happening was they were putting in about the same amount of effort, but the white kids were arriving at high school with more, at middle school with more skills. So you put in an hour, you're going to get more done if you're doing it with more skill than somebody who's doing it with, with less skill. Okay, when we talked about these kinds of results with teachers, it led them to a different understanding of their kids. Okay, similarly with behavior, um, there weren't really differences in how much students wanted to do well in school, but there were differences in the behavior expectations that peers had for one another. So there are just certain styles of self-presentation, certain styles of behavior that kids of different groups expect from one another. And if you want to fit in with your friends, you behave in whatever way you think you have to behave in order to fit in with your friends. And you can have a peer group in which none of the kids like the social style, but none of them individually has the power to change it, and where they all even help to enforce it on others. So some of what we need to do is to work with kids to give them excuses to do what they want to do anyway with regard to behavior and school engagement. All right, so the behavior differences and the homework completion differences did not seem to be, have to do with differences in desire to do well or even effort. Uh, some of it, again, the homework completion had to do with skill differences that developed at earlier ages, and the behavior was part of the youth culture in which they were embedded. They just had different expectations for kids from different backgrounds. The chapter on five challenges to effective teacher professional development was one where we went in and I started including questions on our teacher survey that uh, had the form, think of the last professional development uh, training that you got that had little or no effect on teaching or learning in your classroom. The last time you went to teacher professional development and it really didn't matter what happened, and it didn't affect what happened in your classroom. Well, I had 17 items they could have checked because uh, they said check all that apply. Well, the things they checked most often were things like it didn't, I, the way it was introduced didn't inspire me to try it, teachers were not held accountable for doing it, there was too little support in training, and it was just too much on top of everything else. They did not very often check that they tried to make it work and it just didn't work. So in professional development did not pay off in their classroom, it was not because they went back to their classroom and implemented it and it didn't work, it was because they never implemented it. All right? And so if we take this chart, so we got weak introduction, no monitoring, weak support, and insufficient streamlining, and their implications of those that we talked that I talk about in that particular chapter of the book. Um, we do not have the quality of, of of evidence that we should have by this point that professional development helps, and the teachers can actually improve. Those of us who spend time in schools have seen it happen, so we know it can happen. 
but we don't have the evidence to convince our colleagues who don't spend that much time in schools. And we've got to do more of that work. And some of it's got to do with supervisory practices. So you'll see the last column here, to induce, to get the folks to implement, we want to introduce ideas in ways that are geared to foster interest in positive anticipation. Confirm agreements, including on the design and use of monitoring and feedback mechanisms. So just knowing somebody's going to check with you in two weeks to say, what did you do with what we learned two weeks ago? You're going to do something so you have something to say when somebody checks back. Most of the time in most schools, teachers have zero reason to expect that anybody is ever going to come around and ask, what did you do what we, with what we did in professional development? The uh, offer appropriate training and assistance, organize teams for peer support and sharing, and establish priority, streamline assignments, foster coherence of systems. Okay, this is not rocket science, but it's a set of things that most schools don't do. And so we very frequently don't get implementation of our professional development. And so that's what that particular chapter covers. The final two chapters are making the argument for the social movement. And um, this, the chapter eight in particular focuses on parenting and home, home intellectual climate issues. Um, as as uh, Dick was making some of the generalizations about um, parenting and saying that black middle class parents parent more like white blue collar parents, I saw some people in the audience wincing. Um, but as we collect the evidence, the evidence supports that point of view. And it's not that people don't want to parent in the ways that best serves their their children, but we parent the way we learn to parent from our own parents and from where we learn to parent in our own communities. And it's not a genetic matter, it's a matter of folks having access to information and, and models and images of alternative ways to do it. And we need to set about sharing those alternative ways to do it. People can, can decide what to, which ways they want to do things, but if they never are allowed to have the conversation because we have discourse truncation, we won't allow folks to talk about things that need to be talked about, then we're not going to make the progress that we need to, to make. Just a couple of little charts to show you some of the evidence for these differences. We survey, we've, got, we've surveyed kids across about 15 states in lots of different schools, and we started a couple of years ago including some survey questions for the elementary students about what they do at home. One is, I read almost every day at home, and students could say yes, maybe, and no. And on this chart, you see, for first graders, there's not a lot of difference, about 10% worth of difference in the percentage of kids who say yes to I read every day at home. And you see as you move from first to second to third to fourth to fifth grade, it stays above 60% for, for whites and Asians. But it falls to below 40% for blacks and American Indians and a bit above 40% for Hispanics. But we get this bifurcation, we get this cleavage that opens up and how much leisure reading goes on as kids move through the elementary years. Um, televisions in bedrooms. So consistently, 80% of black kids, 70% of Hispanic kids have TVs in their bedrooms. And having a television in the bedroom is one of the predictors of getting sleepy at school. Okay. And I can, char I can, I don't know how many school districts, I can just put them on a graph and every one, district after district after district, this is the same pattern. It's a national cultural pattern in how we do things. And the point may not be to take the TV out of the bedroom, but maybe it's just to make sure it's turned off after 9 o'clock or whatever time families decide to, to turn it off. The problem now is that even with computers in bedrooms, you can watch television on the computer. So I haven't, decided, I haven't figured out in my own house how to deal with that because there is a computer in there. I've always refused to put a TV in there. All right. So the argument is we need a social and cultural movement. And you'll note policy is a third line down on here. Okay, if we think about the civil rights movement, if we think about the movement for women's suffrage, if we think about any of the major social movements, policy has been in there. But the major thrust has been to change the mindset of the nation, is to try to mobilize folks from all different walks of life to decide the status quo is not good enough. We've got to find ways to improve this. And I'm arguing that with regard to the achievement gap, that's what we need to that's a frame of mind. That's the way we ought to be thinking about it. Uh, there are lots of strategies inside any particular movement, and then there are policies that are in service of particular strategies, and those policies often provide resources for programs and projects, and programs and projects enact particular principles and practices. And I would argue to you that as we think about um, how to understand what we need to do, 
principles and practices might be the nuggets, that programs are just ways of packaging activities that, that live up to particular principles, that abide by certain practices. But principles of positive youth development are the same principles no matter whether it's a parent or a teacher or an after-school program. And we need to have people in all kinds of settings that interact with, with kids doing it in ways that are more optimally nurturant of those children. Um, I like to emphasize youth culture, parenting, teaching, community supports, and leadership. Um, all things I like talked about in the last chapter of the book and spent a few pages on each of those talking about what I think we need to do. That is not to say that we don't also need to be dealing with societal-wide structural features. Uh, the last slide um, here, I just asked the question, what structural and cultural changes must emanate from the larger society in order to encourage and enable changes in homes and communities on the bottom side of the achievement gaps? How can a social and cultural movement for excellence with equity grow to be truly inclusive? And so when we think of, um, I'll just end with this, we think of young people who have social have, have youth cultures that seem to be oppositional to the mainstream society. That's not by accident. It's because they're being treated and made to feel like outsiders for the mainstream society. We've got to find ways to help young people feel like full-fledged members welcome to be part of the society. And maybe as we do that, they will become more willing to do the things that we're asking them to do. I'm reminded of a young man in Harlem who was asked to help think about some, um, some um, city planning that was going on. They were trying to figure out where to put certain buildings in the community. And he was so surprised that they wanted to know his opinion about it. But after a point when he was convinced they knew that they were serious, he said, wow, that makes me feel so good. I think I'm going to pull my pants up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we've been trying to figure out how to stop sagging those pants. Well, include respect. And maybe we'll make a difference that way. With that, I'm going to stop and invite my uh, colleagues to come to the stage to have the open discussion. Uh, I would like uh, the group to tell us why you decided to use mathematics and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> those kinds of scores to look at when there are a lot of intelligences, such as emotional intelligence, cognitive intelligence, the reason why I raise it because for the people who don't recognize their different intelligence that different racial groups may do better in would think they are not up to speed. I'll give you a specific example, and then I won't take any longer. Uh, my classmate when I was in college was Martin Luther King, Jr., and I kept up with him over the years. Even in his papers, they put his uh, transcript in it. And I found that when he got to the seminary school in Pennsylvania, some teacher there gave him a C in public speaking. <laughs> I guess this guy has committed suicide or something like that. <laughs> but the point I'm making is nobody uh, examined that. Uh, yet when you look at the math mathematics, or you look at the language, that's what you do. And it leaves the minority people feeling that they don't do well in anything. And I, I, I know you should turn it back to me and tell me why don't I study that. But I am saying I think that's one of the great difficulties that I have with closing the gap. It is, it is too limited. And there are a lot of other kinds of, of uh, talents that people have, but they don't know it. And then one other point I'll say, and then I'll stop. Uh, I found that the, the problem that you found when you found the uh, went uh, right at 88, 85, and so on. That was another thing going on that you never looked at. This was after the report uh, that said well, our youngsters being educated today were worse than their parents who were years ago, a nation at, uh, nation at risk. Mm -hmm. And that's when even education used to be the highest paid, used to have the highest proportion of money from local communities all over the countries. By the time that the report came out from a nation at risk, education was bumped down to number three or four, whereas police protection came up to number one. And largely that was because a nation at risk said the money we spend on schools doesn't do any good. And that was one of the harmful things. So my basic question is, why don't we study some intelligences other than mathematics and language only? 
And secondly, why don't we look at some other things like graduated from high school? People don't ask you your, your IQ, but they do want to know if you graduated from high school, did you graduate from college? And you'll find those kinds of variables will give you better information on how to deal with this than dealing with language and uh, mathematics schools. Okay, just let me make a couple comments and then others speak. Uh, I got interested in math and English scores when I found out that they predicted more than half of the black-white hourly earnings gap, which is what I talked about earlier. Um, Nation at Risk came out in 1983, and the progress was after Nation at Risk came out for, for, during the period between 1983 and 1988. It's when we made a lot of progress. Um, the stop came after 1988 is when we uh, got the, the stalling. But I, for one, totally agree with you that lots of things matter other than just reading and math skills. We tend to have more measures of those, so it is like the drunk looking under the light post. Okay, so there, there are a number of other things that matter, but um, I'm not inclined to back off of looking at reading and math scores too, because I found those predict some other things I care about, and those are skills that I'd rather have my kids have rather than say, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but I want my kids to also have those other skills. Yeah, we want, we, we agree, we want our kids to have all of it, <laughs> okay? And, we, and I plead guilty to not talking as much about the other skills, but I don't know if, if you want to. Chime in. First, half full of different kinds of intelligence. I, I'm lacking in mechanical intelligence, and I can't figure out. Uh, <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. You probably you might want to raise it. Okay. Um, there certainly are different kinds of intelligences, and there are people studying them. Uh, the person who's uh, uh, made the most progress, I think, is Robert Sternberg, and he talks about three different kinds of intelligence. One is analytic intelligence, which is what IQ tests measure. Uh, another is practical intelligence, which is sort of the ability to understand what's going on in the world and the ability to be effective uh, in uh, solving problems in the real world. And the other is creativity. And, um, and he, uh, he talks about three different graduate students that make perfect sense to me. I know these three people. There's Alice, who's analytically brilliant. You give her a paper to read and the discussion in class is just fantastic. Uh, and then there's a practical Patty, uh, who maybe isn't so analytically brilliant, but uh, she can get the job done. She has a superb career for herself in graduate school. Uh, and then there's, uh, there's creative Kathy, who maybe isn't so analytically brilliant and isn't so pragmatically effective as, as the other, but, uh, but it comes up with you know, an, an idea a minute, and some of them are actually pretty good. So I think all of us have friends and colleagues who differ in these kinds of things. We recognize the difference. Uh, pragmatic intelligence and uh, creativity have been much less studied. They do make an independent contribution to predicting things that we care about, like academic achievement and occupational, uh, occupational success. So let me just add that um, uh, we, we do in the book have uh, some chapters that look at what e economists are now calling non-cognitive skills, so the sort of broader skill set. Um, we are hampered, as Ron was saying, by the lack of data, but David Grismer, for example, looks at early school readiness skills in terms of a broader array of skill sets. Um, I didn't realize, actually, until I read the recent book by Richard Rothstein, who came and gave a presentation here uh, earlier this year, that the NAEP long-term trend data used to collect data on social skills. They used to collect data on teamwork. Are you able to work together with kids and get things done? Uh, this was expensive to measure. It was more expensive to measure than just giving kids test booklets for reading and math. And he's advocating very strongly to have those tests reinstated to the NAEP so that we have the kind of data. But um, I very much like the idea of making sure that we talk about outcomes, things like high school graduation, things like college entry, because that, that is the outcome that we care about. And the, it's the test scores, the cognitive test scores, and the non-cognitive outcomes both contribute towards that stream. But um, all of us now are, are looking at a broader uh, skill set, and some, a lot of this is due to uh, Jim Heckman, an economist who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago and who argues that, if anything, these non-cognitive dimensions of skill, these social skills, what psychologists would call social intelligence or emotional intelligence, are, if anything, more important than the cognitive skill set in terms of determining things like earnings and employment and school completion. So yeah, I completely agree. And um, I, I, I will try the next time I give this talk to add uh, a slide with high school graduation and some other outcomes. I also do talk about the non-cognitive 
dimensions in the first chapter of my book. I'm talking about them tonight. And we, uh, there are a number of people working on high school dropout rates, and folks are finding that high school completion really does add value in terms of folks' life prospects. And even in uh, Dick's book, he points out that more years of college have a particularly large effect for, uh, for blacks. And so staying in school longer um, probably adds an, to a number of dimensions uh, in ways that, that enhance prospects. Yes? There's, a, there's sort of a growing national concern around national competitive, competitiveness on things like science, technology, en- engineering, and math. And I wonder if you were asked to pick one intervention, one policy, what would you emphasize as uh, the policy that has the most leverage around increasing return, not, not returns, um, you know, sort of an in income, but in terms of, of uh, student achievement around science and math particularly? Um, well, I can't, can I pick two? <laughs> uh, so one would be a universal pre-kindergarten, and I mean specifically pre-kindergarten. I don't mean Head Start. I don't mean nursery school or uh, daycare centers. I mean pre-kindergartens uh, either located in the public schools or administered by the public schools. I think if first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade teachers are going to have a fighting chance at raising kids' skill level in math and science, they have to have kids come in on a more even footing. And um, pre-kindergarten is just the right thing to do. Uh, The second thing that I would um, advocate for would be uh, computer-assisted learning programs for kids uh, that allow kids to work at their own pace, that allow kids to catch up. Um, You know, teachers have a very tough time with kids coming into the class who are moving in, kids who've been absent. They're constantly having to catch kids up, and the whole class suffers. And so the more individualized the pace of learning can be, the better off kids will be. And so there's some very promising evidence coming out about computerized learning programs. Also, instruction could be more effective on almost any topic that we, that we talk about. Uh, let me put a plug in. We just finished the, the conference report from the 2008 Conference of the Achievement Gap Initiative was focused on whole district improvement. And uh, folks paid a lot of attention to the idea that every, all, everything in the district ought to be aligned in support of the instructional core. And there's a lot there to say about supervision and getting folks to work effectively in teams and learn how to be more effective teachers. So we could probably sit here and imagine 20 things, uh, 20 ways that middle school and high school teachers could work more effectively together to enhance the quality of science instruction. And I think uh, the quality of instruction needs to be a major focus, no matter science or anything else we are interested in. Thank you. Great panel. Um, Jane, thank you for the invitation. Um, I I have a couple of questions. Um, Jane, in your research, you seem to indicate that integration has had a positive effect on black achievement. Um, But oftentimes, one can hear people Um, uh, black leaders talk about a time when blacks performed better in school because of segregation, because they had teachers who cared specifically about them, and um, that there was a culture that somehow facilitated um, better performance. Um, I wanted you to speak on if there are any um, negative effects to integration, effects of integration, and if so... um, how do you overcome those, um, whether it's the presence of teachers who don't care as much or whether it's the loss of black leadership in, in schools? Um, also, um, I had a question for Richard Nesbitt. You indicated that you're not necessarily a fan of Head Start and that KIPP would be a better program, if I understood correctly. And I just kind of wanted to understand the differences between those two programs, what, what makes one better than the other? And then finally, um, uh, Ron Ferguson, you uh, mentioned that um, black parenting is like, or I'm sorry, I don't know who mentioned it, but you talked about it a little bit, um, black parenting like working class white parenting, and you gave the two slides of television viewing and um, a, amount of reading. And I'm wondering if those are the two major indicators. Are there other indicators of how parenting could be um, improved on either side? So those You're probably not going to be able to answer everything you asked. <laughs> um, but do you want to start? There are three great questions. Yeah, we could discuss them for the next, you yeah. know, 
They're great. There's three great questions. Um, you know, the integration question is really complicated, and it cuts. It's integration across any dimension you could think about it. You could think about integrating across ability groups, or across SES groups, or racial ethnic groups. Um, often, people emphasize the importance of segregation versus desegregation because it's a shorthand for equalizing the resources that kids receive and the teachers that they're exposed to. So, if kids are in substantially separate schools and the white kids are getting better teachers and more resources, and if the schools were then integrated and the black kids had an equal shot at attending those schools, that's one way of equalizing resources. But it raises then a whole host of questions about what happens within schools. And so this, it's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, like my colleagues, I was cramming a 50-minute talk into 20 minutes, so I, I'm not surprised that I left you uh, with the wrong impression about what I was saying about Head Start and KIPP. Head Start is, a, of course, an early childhood education program, which I think is probably not very effective on balance, and I was contrasting that with other uh, programs which are much more effective, uh, and the, the names of them are Perry Project, the Milwaukee Project, uh, and Abbasidarian. Uh, which have big impacts on, uh, on subsequent uh, academic success and occupational success. <clears throat> KIPP is a program for uh, middle school kids. starts at fifth grade, uh, and it's one that's shown itself to be extremely effective. Uh, and on KIPP, I, I forgot to leave out what the most probably important ingredient in KIPP, which is kids spend 60% more time in contact with the school than they do in normal school situations. And it's not just drill and kill. It, they get basically upper middle class experiences. I mean, they get sports, museum, theater, musical instruments, and so on. So it's. Uh, I'll just mention on the parenting front, um, I think there are probably at least two videos on our website of Jelani Mandara from Northwestern University. Uh, he talks about racial differences in, the bal in balancing demandingness and, and, and uh, responsiveness. Okay, black folks tend to be high in the high demand, low responsiveness um, category often. So we kind of boss our kids around more as opposed to being available and listening and warm and warm, fuzzy and responsive. Um, and what he finds is that across blacks, whites, and Hispanics, the highest achievers come from highest households that are above average on both warmth and responsiveness. Okay. So that's one of the categories. I invite you to look at chapter eight of my book, look at some of Jelani Mandara's work. And there's also some discussion of this in, in Dick's book. Hi, um, thank you so much for uh, the great talk. And um, Mr. Ferguson, you had a slide that um, was the, almost like a triangle of the, all the tier yeah. of things with the movement and all the things that need to happen. I work in um, the after school department for BPS and that's one thing we struggle with is that there's not a pro professionalization of the field nationally and that we're almost competing across cities and duplicating the work we're doing um, and uh, at the National Institute of Out of School Time mm -hmm. uh, conference we came together and tried to streamline some of the things we're doing and share best practices. But could you talk about maybe some ideas you've had about how we can make this a national movement um, in changing the culture of schools and creating community schools and extended learning time opportunities for schools? It, it may be that the after school movement isn't quite hefty enough to be a movement on its own. And so if we think of a bigger idea, you can choose your label. I like the label like excellence with equity, a movement for excellence with equity. If we have the conversation of what needs to be part of that bundle, a part of that bundle is going to be constructive, productive things for kids to do after school hours. <laughs> now, there's some tension between the expanded or extended learning day folks and the after school folks, because the, the question is which organization should be in control after, after hours. But if you put that aside, I think most of us can agree that if kids are getting out of school at 1.30 or 2, there ought to be some kind of constructive support between two o'clock and six o'clock. And um, if we can get enough consensus on that, then we can, get, we can start to find the resources to, to make it happen. And I think finding, situating in this bigger picture, I think has a better chance than setting it off to compete mm -hmm. with, with other things. Do you think that there's any connection, just a follow up, do you think there's any connection between, I saw the superintendent speak the other night 
um, the Boston um, Young Leaders for Education Forum. And she said that we need to give those kids, if it's a road race, and those kids that are excelling are doing well running, but those kids that are behind, for whatever reason, we need to give them rollerblades to catch them up. Do you think we could make any connection um, with the services and out of school, before school, extended day, community schools, whatever you want to call it, um, to, to get those resources for those kids? We gotta I get mean, the to society up to those, care about those roller kids. blades. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. For a lot of folks in society, those are not our kids. We've got to find ways to get people to care about those kids. One of the biggest problems we face in suburban communities is the worry that the upper income parents are going to block the allocation of resources to help the lower income kids in those communities. I've got a father in one upper income community who has emailed me at least six times over the last seven or eight months complaining that his district isn't doing enough for gifted and talented. And his district is one that is nationally preeminent for how much it has raised folks across the board. And he's, a, he's worried that all this attention to across the board improvement is neglecting his gifted and talented child. And so we've got to figure out ways politically to make that balance so that folks will be inclined to pay attention to the, to the students that you're worried about. I mean, okay. and BP, and we, we need to, to move okay. on to another uh, speaker. You. We've got about four minutes left. Thanks. So I actually have a question for uh, each of you. So, uh, Professor, you showed that a lot of the test score gap can be reduced. Um, but it's, there's other studies that show as students get older, there's a lot of backsliding that happens. So I was wondering if you could explain sort of what's causing that. Um, the other, another question was, uh, given that hip-hop culture and music is also very popular amongst white students, but their test scores are relatively constant, what else was happening in 1988 that caused this sort of dramatic change in, in, in the results? And then finally, um, in your recent uh, New York Times op-ed, you mentioned a study that I think mentioning um, if students were asked to identify their race before they took the test, their score would actually go down. How do you interpret that, and what are the policy implications? Oh, okay. Um, this is a, a study that's done uh, in the tradition of uh, Claude Steele's work on stereotype threat, and where he talks about, I mean, blacks are perfectly well aware that there's a stereotype out there about inferior intelligence. When they take a test and they, and they, they believe that their intelligence is being tested, they're concerned that they're going to uh, somehow support that stereotype, and this, uh, this uh, work makes their performance worse. And there are things you can do to, to make that less likely or make it more likely. You can make it more likely that they'll be concerned about stereotype threat by having them just indicate their race before they take an exam. You can make it much less likely and have substantially improved performance if you present the test as a puzzle. So, so the, the explanation that Claude Steele would give is that um, some kinds of things will increase this stereotype threat for, for, for black kids, which will increase the likelihood that they will uh, perform poorly because they're so, so concerned about uh, confirming the stereotype. Can you address the point that he's uh, raised about uh, backsliding as kids get older? Uh, actually, I, I, didn't, I didn't get Did that. You want, do you want to repeat that? Sure. Okay. Just to, uh, It seems like a lot. Uh, there's other studies that show as students get older, um, the test graph actually um, gets bigger, even though it's been declining as they, when they were younger students. Yeah, well, I think the, the environmental factors just mount, they get, they get larger and larger, unless they get smaller, which can happen. Uh, high school is a disaster for black kids. Uh, they start out uh, three-fifths of a standard deviation lower in IQ than whites. They end, uh, they end up a full standard deviation lower. Those same kids who are a standard deviation lower in IQ than the white kids, if they go to college, uh, they re the, the gap reduces to two-fifths of a standard deviation. I mean, it, it largely gets rid of the gap. Something about college is, uh, reverses this, this, this ever-increasing gap that, that goes on across, uh, uh, across uh, uh, adult, uh, adolescence, childhood and adolescence. I should also point out, in the Nate, um, whether the gap widens or, or gets, gets bigger or smaller during the teenage years, differs across birth cohorts. Mm -hmm. So if you only look at one place, you'll come to one conclusion. You look at another birth cohort, you'll come to a totally different conclusion. It looks so, so yep. context seems to matter. Uh, with regard to what else was happening at the end of the 80s and the hip hop thing, again, I don't want to make too big, too much of the hip hop hypothesis, but to the degree that we want to make a distinction between black kids and white kids, my argument is that for black kids it was identity. For white kids it was entertainment. Um, for white kids, if you wanted to find some some friends to hang out with who weren't in hip-hop, you could find some. 
uh, black kids, you couldn't find many black kids to hang out with who weren't into the hip hop. So you had no choice but to come along in that direction. And there's a certain style of self-presentation that was off-putting to many adults that a lot of these kids stepped into, and that may have had some consequences. And white kids did not uh, get into it to the degree that black kids did. Uh, uh, last question. Oh, were you going to? Just to add that there's also the explosion of violence in many communities in the late 1980s and the crack epidemic. And that was very disruptive of family life. Yeah. And I can imagine would be most <coughs> disruptive for teenagers. And we can tie these stories together. The yeah, crack so, cocaine yeah epidemic. exactly. Crack cocaine epidemic started in 1984 right. and peaked around 93, I think it was. Well, at least the murder rate peaked around 93 and, yeah. and then turned down with that. And I think they're all, it's all bundled up together. Think about the stories. Yes. Um, hi. Thanks for the great uh, presentations. I um, I was wondering. I sort of left with the impression. I don't know very much about all this, but I left with the impression that uh, the NAEP is very uh, sort of important in using in determining you know what the achievement gap is. But the fact that it's administered every four years made it seem to me to make it a little difficult to tell like what's happening in between. Um, are there other measures that can be taken so that you don't have to wait like four years down the road to see whether something's been effective? What's special about the NAEP is that they've kept pretty much the same test since the early 1970s. There is another NAEP that's a nation's report card, but they change the questions and have to keep rescaling it to try to make it comparable across time. Now, we've also got things like SAT scores. We have the state standardized tests that all the states give. So there are lots of other sources of data. But if we want to make national level generalizations about trends, then the NAEP long-term trend assessment is the one that's tailored uh, to do that. Did you want to make a? No, just, you know, it's, there really isn't anything um, beyond the NAEP. You know, the, we now have um, some nationally representative cohort studies, which I think is going to be another promising way to go. So we have a cohort study of kindergartners who entered kindergarten in 1998, and there's going to be a new cohort starting uh, shortly also of kindergartners. And these are giving us snapshots of succeeding cohorts. Because I think the cohort piece that Ron was emphasizing is really important. And um, there are important cohort changes over time. The cohort that came into kindergarten in 1998 had the lowest, had the smallest black-white test score gaps of any kindergarten cohort that had ever been tested. And there was a lot of fussing about, oh, what was going on? Was it the test? Was it something about the way it was administered? And, it's actually just that the, you know, as, as Dick was emphasizing, the test score gaps have closed. IQ gaps, gaps have closed and test score They're gaps narrowed. have closed. They've <laughs> narrowed. Um, so uh, uh, the, they were smaller in this entry cohort. But the problem is, you know, as you were saying, as kids go through school, the test score gaps widen, which suggests that the schools aren't doing their job. Uh, kids are coming in with about half of the test score gap that they're going to leave with. So. That's another way of saying that the test score gaps are doubling or more during the school years. Well, it also, whether, how much they widen really depends on the metric. Yes. Also. Yeah. I mean, sometimes the same study can use two different metrics and come to two different conclusions about whether the gaps are widening or, or not. So um, we were supposed to stop four minutes ago. So I think we need to um, end the evening. I want to thank all of you for being here and thank our guests for.